welcome to another episode of Data Skeptic Animal Intelligence. Today is a first. I've turned over the interview seat to Becky to interview an author about a particular book for today's episode. Becky, can you give us the details on that? So I got to sit down with Madeline, and she's co-author for Computing Skills for Biologist, a Toolbox. This book is really great. So it was actually Kyle that found this and asked me to, it was you, you found it and had me look at it. And I started going through the tutorials. And basically, this is like a cookbook of computing skills that not only biologists, but I'd say any natural scientist could use. So I started going through it. I've been going through the Unix and shell scripting because automating things will save me a lot of time. But Madeline and I talked about how the book is useful. If you're a professor, you can use it for your class. Or if you're a student like me, you can just get it and start working through everything. It has a great companion website. And then she also had really great advice for students that might be transitioning or considering transitioning into industry and how these computing and data analysis skills can really help you there. Well, both great topics. I look forward to learning more. Let's jump right into the interview. I'm Madeleine Vilnes, and I am a trained biologist. I studied the plant micro uh, interactions in my previous life, and now I'm actually working in finance. I did a stint in liquidity and funding, something entirely else, and now I am analyzing climate risk in the financial world. So how did that transition happen, going from a biologist into industry? I think it started with my, my reluctance, actually, to leave academia. I was really a full-blood researcher. I came to the U.S. to do a postdoc at the University of Chicago. Academia is hard. <laughs> so it involves a lot of failure and keep like lots of work to keep trying and trying, solving challenging questions. And I was really behind it. I really wanted to make that work. So it took me a while to accept that maybe academia is not going to work out. So and then I wrote a book to stay a little longer in academia. It took another stint at a small scientific publisher. So I did a little bit of data science there, marketing analytics. I was a science writer and editor there for a while. Then COVID hit. And it's really this transition into finance came with COVID. Everybody locked down. And I was actually laid off by the scientific publisher, which obviously sucked for the ego, but it was a very short <laughs> recovery phase. And a um, friend of mine who was already working at the Bank of Montreal at the time, so BMO short, Bank of Montreal, was saying like, oh, you know, BMO treats their people well, so why don't you come to BMO? And I thought this actually really bizarre because, again, I was a trained biologist. I had obviously the experience from the book and as a science writer, but had never done anything remotely like associated with the financial world. So it was, why would they even hire me? So while well, I interviewed and was very relaxed because obviously I was there just to gain the interview experience, they wanted to hire me. And that was in the liquidity and funding group. So and I was like, OK, well, they seem to need quantitative skills and they tell me that they will teach me the rest. So why don't I give this a try? So that's how I ended up in finance. If anybody would have told me that four years prior, I would have, or, or just like, you know, when I started the job with someone would have predicted four months ahead, like, oh, you will be working in finance. I would have declared them totally crazy. So it sounds like you had some transferable skills that they really liked to bring you on. So what do you think transferred really well from your science background? Sounds like data analysis is probably one of them, but what else? So as a biologist, it's very easy to produce data. But it's hard to get to the conclusions. So and that's actually now I'm circling and like or migrating a little bit back and forth here, speaking about the book and the, the transition. But it's, it's really connected. Obviously, that's like my career path. Producing data is easy. Analyzing and concluding is hard. So and I realized during my time as a life science researcher that I really had to learn computational skills. I did this initially really autodidactic. It was like a little bit of, so I already programmed an R that was kind of like what I, what I already had under my belt. But I realized I needed a little bit of shell scripting because if you wanted to do anything on a server, if you wanted to do something in like parallel computing, like it needed some, some shell wrapper. So I had no idea, right? And whenever I went to the library, I could get a book with a thousand pages in Unix. But that's not what really what I, what I wanted, what I, what I had time for. And that's actually the, what gave the idea to the book. 
so I can get into depth a little bit more. Let me get back to your questions of the transferable skills, right? These analytic skills definitely like transferred really well. And that's in the end what they hired me for, that like the critical thinking skills, being able to analyze data, but surprisingly also writing as a scientist, it's something that we just have to do. We have to publish our results. So when I only re later realized that in industry, the ability to communicate and write technical, technical writing as much as like just what you did, the method, so to speak, the methodology section was really a valuable skill. Just the ability to know how to cite is already something that, you know, in the academic world, obviously everybody knows that. But within like the general industry setting, that's not a given. So and these were all skills that were very, very valuable. So what we're going to talk about today is the book Computing Skills for Biologists, a Toolbox by Stefano Alessina and Madeline Wilms. So can you tell us a little bit about how the book started and your co-author? It was really born out of the need that I had myself at the time, right? I realized I needed computational skills in order to analyze data. And I picked a lot of up here and there, but like at the time, all these like tutorials that are available today, like Data Camp and like, I mean, you name it, right? There's so much out there. 15 years ago, that didn't exist. Particularly, it didn't exist with a focus on biological sciences. What is the kind of tool set that you need as a, as a life science researcher in order to be successful? And Stefano was actually the first one at the University of Chicago like that I encountered uh, during my uh, career, scientific career, that had created a course. And I approached him at the time to say, like, you need to publish this as a book. This is so good. I had so many hours of trying to just finger, figuring it out under my belt. It was like, this is like so structured, it's so to the point, and like this, this needs to be brought to a broader audience. And apparently it was very convincing, and we started writing the book together. Stefano is now the chair of ecology and evolution at the University of Chicago. And initially I had thought like, oh, you know, this will be very easy because we'll basically just use his already existing lecture material, and that's the book will be easy. But he said, no, 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 we're going to do this properly. We'll write it from scratch. That sounds about right. I think some of my best projects I've started out going, this will be easy. <laughs> and then it wasn't. So I noticed, because I have a copy of the book here, and it's dedicated to all the biologists who think they can't code. And I might throw myself in that camp and I kind of want to learn it. So what inspired that dedication? That's really, again, from my own experience, right? Because you kind of have the feeling, oh, you shouldn't, you should just know more in order to analyze your data. You, so you're not reliant on someone else. For me, coding, initially learning how to code was hard because, again, I tried it on my own. I didn't have like any kind of structured instructions. It was always kind of like a side thing that I had to do, but I felt like, oh, I also don't really have the time actually to dedicate uh, to learning to code. And I guess, I don't know, maybe also the experience uh, from a female perspective that you always think like, right, the imposter syndrome is like in your own way and like it's, it's just hard and everybody else can do it better. But this is exactly what the book tries to address, giving you a foundation, like an entry point to a topic and just give you enough knowledge so you can explore and learn a lot, then you can advance from there, right? If you've never written a single line of Python, you do not want to go like through this 1000 page book. This is really just a primer in the in computing skills for biologists so you can get started. And I think like if you work through all the materials and you're able to solve study questions that we provide, I think this is a very good foundation. That makes sense to me. And I feel like I'm at the beginning of that journey myself. In 2023, just 10 vulnerabilities accounted for over half of the incidents responded to by Arctic Wolf Incident Response. Wouldn't you like to know how to take them off the table and make life more difficult for cyber criminals? That's just one of the essential insights you'll find in the Arctic Wolf Lab's 2024 Threats Report. Authored by their elite team of security researchers, data scientists, and security development engineers, and backed by the data gained from trillions of weekly observations within thousands of unique environments, this report offers expert analysis into attack types, root causes, top vulnerabilities, TTPs, and more. Discover the attack vectors behind nearly half of all successful cybercrimes. 
why ransom demands climbed 20% from 2023, and find out why 2024 will be an especially volatile year for cybersecurity. I got my copy. You should get yours by going to arcticwolf.com forward slash data skeptic. That's arcticwolf.com slash data skeptic. So in the book, it opens with philosophies and goals of computing and biology, and they seem like these are just great for science. And I'll just list them really quick. Automation, reproducibility, openness, simplicity, correctness, and then science as software development. And we don't have to go through every single one of those, but these seem like really good goals for any science. But at the same time, I can see computing is integral to actually making these things happen. So how did you and Stefano come up with these? This is, I think, really driven by Stefano's experience. He had previously, before he started on his academic career, he had worked much more intensely, really as a software developer. He, as a principal investigator, he had noticed lots of people can start to learn, but then writing code that is robust, that is correct, that was like less of kind of like a focus in the beginning. And I, I mean, there is a, a struggle there. If you're learning to code, you cannot do everything at once. And of course, at at the beginning, your code will be awful. But that's why really the book, as we said, starts with a foundation. But we want to get you to a point that you know what is a debugger. That is not something that usually, if you're self-taught, that's something that you kind of want to get into. There's a chapter on writing good code, how to name your variables, commenting. It's very like maybe straightforward and obvious advice, but as a beginner, often we we noticed that people are str- struggling. And I, I did it because I was the beginner, right? And he had seen this a lot within his courses that he taught. That makes sense. If you're self-taught, that it might be a little bit harder to learn some of those best practices without like a mentor. So in the book, there's a chapter on R. And as a biology graduate student, We get a lot of R hammered into us, but there's so many other cool tools. And I was wondering if you have a few favorites that the book covers that you find especially useful. I think this has really shifted R as the language that is the most fluent for me as well. And at the time, I had very little Python exposure. But if you're leaving the biological sciences, then obviously Python is the much more ubiquitous language. And now with like lots of machine learning, while there's implementations in in R, it's usually if you want to be at the forefront, Python is your language. But then one of the things that I really learned while writing the book, for instance, was version control. And version control, you might initially not quite see why that is even necessary coming from this autodidactic perspective. But once you get into and you force yourself to spend the few minutes of like properly uh, documenting and tracking your code, it makes such a huge difference in terms of reproducibility, right? You can go back and say like, okay, I published this paper, but this obviously like this was maybe a year ago and there has been so much code written in between, right? This has changed, this has, the code has been modified, but you can go back and say like, okay, what was my version that I exactly submitted at the time? Maybe with that, you might also have a folder that has all your different code versions, if you are that structured and organized, right? And you might be able to go back and say like, oh, what did I, what did I submit? But then you have this, we've all seen this, right? You have this final, final version 3.6. And that's exactly what you can avoid, right? By using such a tool as version control. So that is definitely that has most influenced my working, my coding at the time. In retrospect, the chapter that was really very important for my further career path is SQL. I hadn't much SQL experience at the time. I now use this daily within my job now, right? Or also like my previous team in the financial world. What other chapter? I think definitely the writing could code resonated with me. And also actually the LaTeX was something that I had maybe not, I had some exposure and it was basically my tool to make my resume stand out and make it really pretty. But here's the irony. Obviously, LaTeX helped a lot in writing the book. And I not I know not everybody might be writing a book. And maybe like that's not the what I'm saying, why you need to learn LaTeX. But definitely it helps if you just like a comprehensive documents such as your thesis, even your master thesis, any kind of publication definitely benefits from LaTeX. And often it's like this where you just need to invest a few hours to get started. It's not about like right away writing your macros. You can really have a little bit of effort and have a big return right away. I have found that other biology students that I've worked with 
if they're not already in computational biology, they don't necessarily even know what latex is. So what is it? So it's a markup language. If you and your audience are familiar with HTML, so you have the content and the formatting, so to say, separated from each other, right? You say like, this is my heading, but then you have these additional commands around it that say like, this is the title and that's why it's bold, right? That is kind of like the, the premise of the separation of content and formatting. That's maybe in the most simplest terms. It's a markup language. And really that understanding then helped for me. I mean, using LaTeX, like I, you can use that in your R studio, right? You can then use, if you have a little bit of LaTeX knowledge, that might be helpful to write out pulling reports of your analyses out of R studio, right? If you can knit it. So there's specific packages there that you can utilize. And just having a little bit of foundational understanding there with LaTeX helps you with these other tools. So that's also why we chose to have so many different tools. Knowing a little bit of all of each, like having a foundation, allows you really to complement having this toolbox, right? That's the subtitle of the book. It's a toolbox. So and you can pick and choose and really be prepared to using the best matching tool to your task, because that's what I found myself actually always doing, because I knew R. I tried to do everything in R. If you have this hammer, everything you want to slap like a nail, but that's not actually often the case, right? You need something more specific, like where I said, like, Python might be adv like advantageous versus R, or knowing actual rudimentary SQL is much more helpful in trying to put everything in a gigantic deployer chain. There's a couple tools that I read about that I'd like to chat quickly about because I know there's students out there, like I think half the audience or more will be like, yes, I know markup language, that's great. And then we're reaching some ecologists that are out in the woods and getting dirty and they're going to be like, what's a markup language or what's this or what's that? So one thing I have found useful, and I'm, I'm still at the beginning of the book, is going through shell scripting mm -hmm. and getting Unix set up. And I don't know how many, as a bit animal behavior researcher, how many hours I've wasted moving video files over one at a time because they're such large mm -hmm. files, it, like processes mm -hmm. that you could automate instead of you just sitting there. So could you tell us a little bit about the shell scripting uh, section of the book and why you chose to put it in there? Why is it useful? As you describe, it's really if you want to process things in parallel at a time, being able to work on a server where maybe your interface isn't a graphical one, that's when it's really helpful or being able to schedule scripts, right? And that's, again, where these tools really integrate with each other. So you can use, for instance, a shell script to schedule your Python or, or your R script or whatever, whatever it one should be. So I mostly used it at the time for working yeah, on a remote server. So I knew how to log in, how can I create a folder on this remote machine, if there's not a graphical interface, that's really all that I needed. But you can get, like, the, the chapter will show you that you can actually do very powerful things. How can I search for a file by name under certain criteria? How can I search for text uh, within all my flat text files? And how to get started is really a little bit as like uh, as you're based on what uh, operating system you are on. So, if someone working already with the in the Linux system like is very familiar, there's probably not much explaining to do. If you're on a Windows computer. Windows really tries to hide all the kind of things under the hood. So then, but there's the command line tool still available to you. Or if you're installing tools like Git Bash that gives you a rudimentary terminal, then you can also get a little bit into these more command line tools and where you actually write words that are the commands instead of clicking and dropping something, which we're usually, more, as a Windows user particularly, you might be more used to. If you're on Mac OS, that's also usually very accessible to you. You have a terminal available. So, and then, right, it's also nice because you're independent of like a graphical interface, even if you're saying you your version control. You don't need any kind of graphical inter like software in order to manipulate your version control. So we actually, sh that's the case that we, that's the, the way we, we demonstrate version control on the terminal. So again, it's kind of the, you need a little bit, just this little bit of shell scripting in order to use really get a lot of use out of these other tools and not be lock locked into a particular software suite. That makes sense. And I went through the process of getting Git Bash because I'm on a Windows machine mm -hmm. and was able to copy all the directories. 
We've talked a bit about what students might need to get started. So you mentioned all three operating systems. Do they need a particularly powerful computer? They, they don't, really. I myself i am probably on a Mac that is, I don't know, 13 years old, and it still serves me, serves me well. I mean, obviously, I want to say, like, if you're doing powerful computing, then obviously it's not enough. But I'm saying I would think if you're picking up this book, then you're not likely already need a lot of processing power. So the book is really written, actually, really with the field scientists, with the ecologist, field ecologists in mind. It's for people who are not in a maybe in a computational biology program because they will have their dedicated curriculum. This is really to the breadth of like either lab scientists or behavioral animal ecologists, right? That's really the target audience. You don't need a super powerful computer to go through the book, but your own science is your business. Do they need to purchase any software? No, that's a great point as well. Everything in the book that we cover is open source and freely available. This comes with public domain li licenses, so you don't need to purchase anything. I mean, the book is relatively cheap as it comes for text to textbooks, I want to say. And that was one of the choices that we had. We don't have any color, color prints, any color figures in the book itself to the price affordable for grad students, master students. But then it's the, the really funny aspect that we have a chapter on visualization that doesn't have any graphics. <laughs> so <laughs> it still makes sense. Like uh, if you pick up the chapter, work through it, that uh, we have materials on the, web, on the website and also you generate the graphics while you go along, right? But that always like is kind of like a funny side note. I don't know if you recognize that the visualization chapter doesn't have much, it doesn't have much in terms of figures. I think the book in total has like five figures. As a student, I definitely appreciate any efforts to, <laughs> to make things a little bit cheaper. Okay, so I think the only other thing that students would need is a text editor that they like on their computer, and then that covers everything to get started with the book. Absolutely. I would recommend if you're starting to code, having a dedicated where I want to go here, the syntax highlighting is really helpful. You don't actually, you can write Python code in Notepad. You don't need any specific software there either, but definitely there's dedicated software, many free of charge that you can, depending on your operating system, and there are people you will find, they will passionately uh, argue for one over the other. I will not go into this discussion. I really don't want to have this in the way of actually getting started. I find this like often, even if you choose the mo the suboptimal tool and you know you don't want to learn them right away, that that's totally okay. You can switch at a later time. So don't be blocked by uh, like picking the most optimal editor interface. So that's really beside the point. So, okay, so we've talked about everything you need to get started, and you've mentioned a, a website. So what can either professors or students that are picking up this book, what kinds of things can they find on the website that support the book? So the website is helpful if you pick up the book and just to set up your environment, you will find some instructions, it, well, both within the book, but it relies also on the website. There's lots of instructions on how to set up to get started for the particular chapters. And I want to point this out, actually, I don't know, I haven't really mentioned that you can read most of the chapters independently. You do not think of that you need to go through the book cover to cover. You can start, you can actually stand alone, just work through the SQL chapter. Other chapters rely a little bit on each other. I mentioned, right, the visualization chapter, for instance, is based on the R language, right? If you don't have some basic R understanding that this will be a rough one. And the writing good code shows example in Python, but I think you can even read, read through the uh, writing good ch code chapter without having much Python exposure. Version control is entirely independent. Uh, the shell scripting is entirely independent. LaTeX is independent, right? So you can really also jump back and forth based on your priorities. And the website enables that again to show you here is what you particularly need just to, to work through that. You're not dependent on the website, but it will have some useful information. We also target a little bit of mostly, right, it's a, te it's a textbook. It's definitely meant also for the autodidact who like wants some structure to help them along like on, on their learning journey. But it's also a book that we really uh, try to bring to the attention to instructors who might base their course 
based off on the course, right? Again, that's the function of a textbook. And that's, like I revealed this earlier, that's really how the book came to existence, That because it was based on classes that Stefano taught at the University of Chicago. This is still amazes me. He taught the entire book in 12 weeks. So each chapter... So I think the Python was two weeks, but those pure student, poor students, I read you get, you get like you get your challenge when you sign up at the University of Chicago, but they worked through the entire book in 12 weeks, which I still find amazing. Well, that's a pretty good testament that it can be done. I also want to mention that we really do monitor the inbox there. So if anybody wants to get in touch, if they have questions, I, there's multiple positions where you can reach out to the authors, like contact forms. And if you fill one and because you get stuck somewhere, we will get back to you. Sometimes it might take a day or two, but we're very dedicated. So, And the other one, there's a box to report errors, so far there's one, and I'm still proud of that, like like multiple years later. <laughs> so we did a very good job, like proofreading. That's, that's actually very impressive. <laughs> I think I would struggle to do that with a book. We've talked a bit about the different tools you go over in the book, how you got started and why you wanted these skills. And I wanted to circle back and just talk a little bit about what happens to scientists or even data analysts if you don't have these up-and-coming skills? Well, I would argue that it's hard to be a data analyst if you don't have some computational knowledge. Again, the book is a great foundation for continuing on your way in the data-related fields. You will notice if you head over to my LinkedIn profile, right, I never called myself a data scientist. I think like uh, that's maybe also because I'm married to a like a machine learning researcher who is like doing the real stuff. So I'm very careful of like what I label myself here. But I found nevertheless having a good analytical toolbox has been so helpful. My titles have never actually or rarely been data analyst. But my jobs have been very analytical heavy. And that's also like how you can also see the book. The book is really a preparation for you to have these transferable skills and then going into industry. Also being open-minded in terms of what jobs can you do with that. It's not necessarily to look for the title that is data analyst, but there are so many jobs where 90% of your day-to-day work is data analytics, but the job function will be called something entirely else. So right now I'm a climate specialist. Previously, I was a liquidity and funding manager. So that like, doesn't say much about analytics, but that's in the end. I really relied on these foundational skills that I learned as a researcher and then with writing the book and, and later certainly I expanded on that. The scientific training you had in terms of being able to ask really good questions and figure out if things are true were complemented by these computational skills. So while you might not be a hardcore pure data analyst, you get to do these really cool hybrid positions, it sounds like. I would say I'm a hardcore data analyst. (laughs) Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm I'm drawing the distinction of being a data scientist. And I mean, now we're getting in a discussion to really differentiate the two. But I am also right. I'm not a programmer where I'm saying like, again, I'm not writing. I'm not a software designer, right, or software engineer. So that's where I'm drawing the distinction. I do a lot of data analytics that in that respect, yes, hardcore, even though it's not my job title. I think that helps me understand a lot better. So is there anything regarding the book that you want to discuss that I didn't bring up or mention? There is uh, programs, and I'm happy to do some advertisement here. Like there's the Cheeky Scientist Association, which is like a like a group really providing additional skills, uh, how to transition from academia to industry. And one of the things that they really add, like try to drill in is the value of informational interview. What is an informational interview? You reach out to someone, and usually it means you will reach out to 10 people of who you find their job title or whatever. You have some contact. You might even be called on, on LinkedIn. You email 10 people, and maybe one of them will reply and actually be willing to talk to you. And that can really be a 20-minute conversation of what are you doing? What are the kind of skills that you need? How did you get there? And that provides so much information 
about really what you need. And I found I was so worried about my skill set, my technical skill set. And that in the end is not usually what makes or breaks your success in industry. It's really, can you work in a team? The soft skills, how much are you collaborating? And I, I kept think, thinking like, of course I can collaborate. I collaborate with my, my colleagues in the lab all the time. We share a PCR machine. Of course I'm collaborating and I wrote papers with people. But it is really a different beast altogether because in academia, you're often really the maker of your own success. I mean, to some extent, there's also a lot of luck and who you know. But you are defining your research story to a large extent. And just whether you schedule the PCR machine is not really collaboration yet. <laughs> because in a company, there's a lot of redundancy, actually. And that is on purpose. You want multiple people to be doing, in a way, the same thing. Because you don't want to have a key dependency. You know, this one person leaves the company, the knowledge is gone, right? It's really then what collaboration is. And can you deal with them? Can you deal with someone who's maybe not easy to deal with? That's exactly like what is meant by collaboration and teamwork. I underestimated that at the time, what that would take and how important that is. I spent eight years in an in industry position before coming back to do my PhD and found some of the things, if you're in academia, that would be troubling doesn't happen in industry. And the kind of collaboration you have to make is very different, just like what you were saying. It's sort of collaboration times 10. <laughs> you really rely on each other to make it successful. And that is often in academia, right? At least let's let's say I, I cannot speak for all of academia, but in the field, in the, in the labs that I worked in, you obviously interact with people and you, might, you will have co-authors. But, you know, one person was responsible for that experiment and the other person was responsible for that other experiment. And that's exactly not what it is in industry. We have far fewer people involved with each dependency in a PhD dissertation versus if you're in industry, where I found teams were much larger. And if you don't have a small piece done on time, you have a waterfall effect. So it's just the type of collaboration is very different. So what, have you, what did you do in your career to develop those soft skills? I think it was actually learning by doing. So I mentioned that I worked for a scientific publisher for a while, and I did not fit well with the company culture. I did a lot of mistakes there. I was good at what I did, but people really didn't like me. And I was like, what is going on? And I only like it later, I realized, well, I didn't focus on building relationships with people. And that's the big difference that I do now. The first three months in every job is not about showing how great I am and what are all the skills that I bring. This is tempting, right? You want to hit the, round, the ground running and you want to really show what you've got. Nope. The first three months are about building relationship with the people that you work in with. And that's really getting to know people, not immediately getting to the agenda. And now I'm German. I have a little bit of a cultural background also that like I don't usually talk about the weather when I enter a room. <laughs> so, But I had to learn this. <laughs> so and now my really my focus is that I would go around introducing myself and have a chat and try to learn what is their communication style. Do they want to communicate by email? There's generational differences, right? Some people you really need to pick, to pick up the phone in order to get to get any kind of decision or like an a buy-in, right? And there's like, especially if you're working in international context and obviously like, let's face it, most industry, like you will have a lot of cultural differences like in a diverse team, which is good, right? But then obviously like learning how important is hierarchy for them, how important is punctuality, right? There's lots of different priorities for people and figuring this out, that's really where I'm saying, this is my first three months. And that is something definitely that that's for me the big difference in terms of soft skills and doing a job well. And after I've mastered the relationships, after I've formed the relationship, then I'm actually much more successful employing my my technical skills and being successful in bringing the collective goal forward. That makes a lot of sense, um, especially in big team environments where I've been in. If you don't know your coworkers and what motivates them and, and what they're up to, it's a lot harder. So that makes sense. The last wrap-up question is, what's next for you in terms of your career? Are you going to keep with the 
with what you're up to. And then also I've noticed on your LinkedIn and just looking that um, you're passionate about science communication. Obviously you're here and, and you've written this book. So in terms of career and some of your communications work, what's next for, for you? So I had just transitioned within BMO. So I wanted to stay with the company because again, uh, good work-life balance, just feeling appreciated and cared for, right, is also maybe the other advice that I would give someone to transition. In the, in the beginning, it often feels like, I just want a job. And I did this mistake as well. I just joined like because someone offered me something and I accepted. So because I like, you know, it's rough and particularly in today's job market, like it feels like there is, it's so hard to get one that you just accept as soon as you're successful but I learned over time right that's not all like if you want to be somewhat happy if you don't want to hate your job like you need to find a company that has a good cultural match and that was the case for me at BMO like because curiosity is rewarded I feel appreciated for the work that I do so that's why I really stayed with the company uh, now and was looking for a job maybe to bring me a little bit back into the life science realm and that's exactly what I managed to do so I joined the climate risk team so climate risk analytics so I investigate how does transition risk so policy changes in relation to climate like affect our customers our risk that the bank carries or physical risk. How much exposure do we have to an area, like because there's a hurricane going on somewhere? And this is again a very analytical, like really relies on the technical skill set as well, but brings me a little bit back to like sustainability questions and the life science. So definitely, like I, my heart is still there. But there's a lot of things, obviously, that you're trying to uh, navigate with, like having a family and making a living, which is <laughs> like when you initially start and you're young. Maybe they're not, it's not quite, I mean, obviously you want to earn money, but at a later time, there's a lot of more consideration to have there. So, and from that aspect, I really liked, I did a lot of things in my career. I tried freelancing. So I worked actually as a web developer for a while. And that's why the companion side to the book is my doing. That was certainly fun. And that again, also gives a lot of skills that now come back handy. As a web developer, I learned how to design a dashboard, use of space and be having it look tidy. That was all aspects that I really was focused in and doing UX and UI design. And now that comes in again, right? If I'm developing a dashboard for business decisions, then again, having this look well, very well organized. What are the key metrics that I need to present? How do I present this? Like it all comes together. For me, I have many done so many career transitions and it's still all is woven together with this an analytical background, even if my job titles are reading like a bizarre hodgepodge, it's always the analytical thread that goes through all of that. So in terms of right now, I'm in a great position. What will come next? Who knows? Do you have any side projects related to outreach, STEM communication, anything like that right now? I I would say the STEM communication that I'm currently doing are with my kids to tell them <laughs> about the, the world, the like science education that comes there, which unfortunately doesn't leave me much additional time to do a lot of additional outreach. Well, I appreciate you coming on today to do a little bit with us. Are there any places that guests could follow you online, like um, any social media Obviously, the website for the book will share. So I would say my LinkedIn is probably the only thing that I keep up to date. My own personal website is terribly outdated. That was really when I, I set this up when I searched a job four years ago, and I haven't really done anything on it. So this will not actually be well, well representative. It's really the LinkedIn and just reach out, shoot me an email. So and there you will find it online through my website, definitely. But also if you write to the book's authors on the, on the book's website, you will definitely reach me. Excellent. Connect on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. That's maybe the easiest. Sounds good. I'll definitely do that after this. 